Let us pray. Almighty God and our Father, we thank you for bringing us together again today so we can hear more and know more about Jesus Christ. He is our Savior and our Redeemer. You sent him to die for us. You sent him so that he can reign in our hearts and eventually he will reign in the world wherever there is sun. And Lord, we are praying that today, by your Spirit, you will reveal more of Jesus to every one of us in Jesus' name. We pray that you will take these words of Scripture, you open them up, you enlighten us in your Word, so that we will know more of the glories and the triumph of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. Last week we started the study of the book of Psalms. And the book of Psalms is a very popular book in the Bible. For most religious people, even those who don't go to church at all, they seem to be familiar with the book of the Psalms. And they do many things with the various chapters, the various Psalms. Some people will read a few of the psalms in their religious worship every time they gather together they seem to think that the reading of the psalms will give them some power some revelation some inspiration some protection other people will read the psalms in water and try to drink the water or bath the wa with the water thinking that somehow some way the power that they think is in the Psalms will get into the water and they will be able to be a blessing to them internally and externally. Other people see that David, the writer of many of the Psalms, went through many tumults, many battles in his life, and he overcame. And he seemed to feel that the power with which he overcame has been hidden in the Psalms because of that. In the morning, in the afternoon, and before they sleep, they try to read some of the selected psalms. Some of them know that David, the writer of the majority of the psalms, had many enemies. But then, that he was able to overcome. And they knew that he was a man of prayer. And that they feel these prayers had been written down in these psalms. And therefore, they feel that if they will read the psalms, it will be for them. The power of God in prayer. But unfortunately, for many of them, they do not have the experience that David had. And because of that, all they are trying to get through the Psalms, they didn't get. One, David had a foundation to his conviction. He knew everything that he ought to know about the greatest problem of man. They don't seem to know that man has the greatest of all problems which is sin. David knew the only way to deal with that sin, to deal with the greatest of all problems of men. They don't seem to know how to deal with the problem of, of man, that is, with their sin. He knew about the coming Christ, the very Son of God. They know nothing about the Son of God as the Christ, as the Messiah, as the Redeemer, and as the Savior. Because of this, all they are trying to get from the Psalms, they are not able to get at all. Now let me just show you before we go into the study of Psalm 2 today, the knowledge that David had of the great problem of man, and also the way he knew that that problem ought to be solved. In Psalm 51, verse 5, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with iso, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins. Blot out all mine iniquities, creating me a clean heart, O God, 
and renew a right spirit within me. David knew that he was conceived in sin. He was shapen in sin. He was born in sin. He knew that as soon as he was born, he went astray. In Psalm 58, verse 3, the wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born, speaking lies. This man, David, knew that the problem he had, he had the problem because of sin. And he knew he was not the only one. He knew that everyone had gone astray. The Bible says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In Psalm 53, verse 3. Every one of them is gone back. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. He said he wasn't living righteously. And he said there is nobody on the face of the earth in his own natural ability who can live righteously. And he depended upon the Lord. He said, Lord, wash me. He said, Lord, cleanse me. He said, Lord, renew me. He said, Lord, blot out all my iniquities. He said, create in me a clean heart, O God. Can you see this man, David? He knew the Lord in a saving manner. He knew of the salvation of the Lord. He said, one, I am guilty. He said, I know I am a sinner. He said, I know I cannot save myself. I depend upon you to wash me, to cleanse me, to blot out all my transgressions. And eventually he said, save me. Forgive me. Take away all my sins. And he prayed until he had assurance that his sins were taken away. Psalm 32, from verse 1. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputes not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. Psalm 103, verse 1 to verse 3. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Forget not all his benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, and who healeth all thy diseases. You can see that this man had experienced the forgiving power of the Lord, the redemption of the Lord. He had been redeemed by the Lord. And you know, when you are born again like that, we say you become a child of God. Psalm 103 and verse 13. Like as a father pities his children, so the Lord pities them that fear him. So the Lord pities them that fear him. And you see this man, David, he knew the Lord to such a point that he knew that conversion experience is so very important. And after he had been forgiven, then he consecrated his life to telling others about the conversion experience, about how they will know the Lord as their own Savior. Come back to Psalm 51. Verses 12 and 13. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways. And sinners shall be converted unto thee. Now you can tell that David understood the nugget, the reality, the death, the height of the gospel. He knew about the forgiveness of sin. He knew about the conversion experience. He knew about the joy of salvation. And he also knew about the responsibility of sharing that message of the gospel and telling other people. Not only that, he knew about the Lord Jesus Christ. If you notice in the passage that we read today in our Bible reading, in the gospel according to saint matthew he asked the people who do you say that christ is and he said the son of david and then he said how is it that david called him lord in matthew chapter 22 matthew chapter 22 from verse 41 while the pharisees were gathered together jesus asked them saying what think ye of christ whose son is he they say unto him, the son of David. He says unto them, how then does David in spirit 
notice that in spirit call him lord saying the lord said unto my lord sit thou on thy right hand until i make thine enemies thy footstool you can see here that david knew that christ will come the messiah will come he also knew that the messiah will have enemies he also knew that god the father will make all the enemies of jesus christ his footstool david knew that jesus christ will reign wherever there is sun david knew that jesus christ will reign over all his enemies david knew that even though there be many enemies and adversaries of the lord jesus christ yet jesus christ will eventually triumph over them and that jesus christ will sit on the right hand of majesty and then he said the lord said unto my lord he said the god of heaven said unto jesus christ the coming king sit thou on my right hand until i make all thine enemies thy food stew. that's what we're reading about today the triumph of christ the king now we're back in psalm 2 reading from verse 1 why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing the kings of the earth said themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the lord and against his anointed saying let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us he that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh the lord shall have them in derision then shall he speak unto them in his wrath, vex them, and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the hidden for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession thou shalt break them with a rod of iron thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel the wise now therefore o ye kings the instructed ye judges of the earth serve the lord with fear and rejoice with trembling kiss the son lest he be angry and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little blessed are all they that put their trust in him if you're a bible christian you will know that there are passages we refer to as passages having double reference one it refers to the natural and two it refers to the spiritual one it refers to somebody on earth two it refers to somebody in heaven one it refers to somebody that you can see now two it refers to somebody who is yet to come and it is the attribute or the characteristic of scripture to bring the past and the future into the same single passage when david said all this that he said in psalm 2 he was referring to something past already he was also referring to something future it's only in the word of god you find that that is why we know the bible is inspired of the spirit of god from cover to cover that the bible in the same chapter in the same passage can refer to something that has happened already and at the same time refer to something that is yet to happen now what does that mean this passage refers to david a man living on the face of the earth at that time and it refers to experiences that he had in the past and it also refers to something that had happened to him in his anointing and kingship over the people of israel but at the same time it refers to the lord jesus christ who was yet to come you see when david was anointed God laid claim to him and he said, I have found a man after mine own heart. He was the anointed of the Lord. And yet you will know that from the very beginning, he was rejected. When Samuel came to anoint a king in the house of Jesse, 
all the children of David were called. They didn't, all the children of Jesse, pardon me, were called. But he didn't call David. He was out in the farm. Which means that they didn't think or feel that he was to be appointed to be king. Eventually he was brought and he was anointed. In the very next chapter after his ordination, after his anointing, after his appointment, there was a battle with the Philistines. And he went to the battlefield and his brother said, What are you doing here? Rejection again. Eventually they brought him to Saul. And Saul said, You are a lad, you are a young person, you cannot do it. Rejection again. He appeared before Goliath and Goliath disdained him and said, Is this what they have sent to me? Am I a dog? That's rejection again. Eventually, he killed Goliath. And then the women began to sing that David has slain tens of thousands, but Saul is thousands. Saul became angry. He was chasing after that man. He wanted to destroy him. Eventually, if you read the story of the life of David very well, all the Philistines and their lords, they were against David. They wanted to exterminate him, destroy him, annihilate him. Rejection. And it was, it was like they were in a conspiracy. Not only that, Absalom, at the backyard, at the court of the palace, he will get the minds of the people, and then he will say, if you make me the king, I'll do better than David. Eventually, if you know the story of the life of David, he was driven away from the throne. He was running away from Absalom. Then eventually Absalom died. Absalom was killed in that controversy. Before David died, Adonijah rose up again. And you know that Ahithophel, one of his counselors, had teamed up with Absalom. And you will find rejection. Eventually, even when Saul died and Jonathan died, he became king, but only in Judah. For seven and a half years, all the rest of the children of Israel, they will not accept David as their king. It appears that both the Gentiles and the Jews, they were against David. That's why he said, why do the heathen rage the Philistines and the Gentiles? And the people imagine a vain thing. Why is it God has appointed David as king? And yet all these people, they imagine a vain thing and they are not going to accept me. The kings of the earth, they said themselves, the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder and let us cast away their cords from us, which means... Let us reject the Lord's anointed. Don't let us have David to reign over us. But then David said, God has given me the promise. He has made me king. He has anointed me king. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Because the plans and purposes of God for David will be fulfilled. And then he said, Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath, and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. That's where David reigned. In Zion. In Jerusalem. And then he, he went on. He continued. But then, as you look at the New Testament, you will see that this psalm does not terminate with David. Oh yes, it has reference to David. But it does not terminate with David. It says a lot about Jesus Christ Jesus the Messiah and the Savior. Let's look now at the New Testament and see the comment of the New Testament concerning this psalm in Acts chapter 4. Verse 24. Acts chapter 4 verse 24. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is, who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, Why did the heathen rage, and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up. The rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. Can you see that? That's some two right there. The apostles had just been anointed with the Holy Ghost. And Jesus said when the Holy Ghost has come, 
He will bring to your remembrance all things that I've said unto you. He will guide you into all truth. He will tell you the finality and the completeness of the interpretation of Scripture. He will guide you. He will show you the truth of Scripture. And now the Holy Ghost guided them. And they said, this Psalm 2 is talking about Christ. Why did the heathen rage? And the people imagined vain things. The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ of a truth. Against thy holy child, Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, where the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together for to do whatsoever thine hand and thy counsel determine before to be done. So you can see that Psalm 2 is a psalm for Christ. A psalm of the Messiah. Look at Acts chapter 13. Verse 33. Acts chapter 13. Read from verse 32. And we declare unto you glad tidings. How that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God has fulfilled the same unto us their children, in that he raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm. Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. You see this refers to Jesus Christ. It says it was written in the second psalm. Thou art my son. And it says this day have I begotten thee. Hebrews chapter 1. Verse 5, for unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, and this day have I begotten thee, and again I will be a father. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Let's come back to Psalm 2. We now study Psalm 2 on the basis of him who is to come. You have seen Psalm 2 on the basis of him who came before, on the basis of David, that he was rejected and yet God appointed and anointed him. You have seen some too in relation to the past, in relation to David who lived before and served his generation. Now we're going to look at some too in relation to Christ, the King, the Messiah, the Redeemer, the one appointed and anointed by God to be the Lord, to be the Christ, to be the Messiah. We're going to divide the psalm to three parts. One, enmity against Christ's kingdom. Two, establishment of Christ's kingdom. Three, exhortation to people, princes, and kings. Let's go back to Psalm 2 from verse 1. Why do the heathen rage? And the people imagine a vain thing. The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord, against his anointed saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. There are many prophecies in the Old Testament concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. Almost every phase, every area of the, of the life of Jesus Christ was prophesied. His conception by the virgin, his birth in Bethlehem, the rage of King Herod against Jesus Christ. The destruction of children at the time of the birth of Jesus Christ. The ministry of Jesus Christ having the spirit and the power of the Holy Ghost upon him. The opening of the eyes of the blind and the lame walking. And his preaching the glad tidings of the good news to the poor. And then his betrayal by one of his disciples and his rejection by the people of Israel, and his crucifixion, and his resurrection, and his ascension. Everything was prophesied in the Old Testament. More than 1,000 years before those things took place. That's another thing that shows you as a Bible Christian, that the Bible is the Word of God. If the Bible were not the Word of God, how could the Bible prophesy? About a thousand years before Jesus came, about the rejection of Christ, about all that Herod will do, all that Pilate will do, all that the Jews will do, all that the Gentiles will do. And everything came into fulfillment to the very letter. 
Why do the heathen rage? Why do the people imagine a bent thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord. Against his anointed. Look at Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. If you know the story very well, it's talking about King Herod. When he heard of the birth of Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 2 verse 1. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judah, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, we, Where is he that is born, king of the Jews? For we have seen a star in the east, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Then, and when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. When, and they said unto him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, and thou Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, at not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. Verse 16, Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth, and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem, in hope that he will be able to kill Jesus Christ the Lord. And in all the coast thereof, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. That's the fulfillment of what the Lord said in the Old Testament, that the kings of the earth, the rich, they are in a tumult, planning that they will destroy Christ. The reason is they did not want Christ to reign over them. Luke chapter 19. Jesus also told the parable concerning that same thing. In Luke chapter 19, verse 12, it said, Therefore a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called the ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a message after him, saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. That's the enmity against Christ and his kingdom. That's the enmity of the Gentile and the Jews. The enmity of all the people that reject Christ. And in Luke chapter 23, Luke chapter 23, the whole chapter is talking about Pilate and Herod in their conspiracy against the Lord Jesus Christ together with the whole multitude of the Jews that presented Jesus Christ in the mock trial. Luke 23 from verse 1, And the whole multitude of them arose, and led him unto Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation, and forbidding to give tribute to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ a king. You know the light against him. It was conspiracy against him. It was their tumult, their opposition against Christ. He never told them not to pay tribute unto Caesar. He told them give unto Caesar what belongs to Caesar. And he told them give unto God what belongs to God. Now in verse 3, And Pilate asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answered him and said, Thou sayest it. You confirm it. He said, Oh yes, I am. Then said Pilate to the chief priests and to the people, I find no fault in this man. And they were the more fierce, saying, He stirreth up the people, teaching throughout all Jewry, beginning from Galilee to this place. When Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked whether the man were a Galilean. And as soon as he knew that he belonged unto Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who himself also was at Jerusalem at that time. 
And when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceeding glad, for he was desirous to see him of a long season, because he had heard many things of him, and he hoped to have seen some miracle done by him. Then he questioned him with, with him in many words, but he answered him nothing. And the chief priests and scribes stood and vehemently accused him. And Herod with his men of war set him at naught and mocked him and arrayed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him again to Pilate. You can see here their tumult. You can see here their opposition. But Jesus knew about it and he knew the outcome. What did Jesus say about the outcome in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18? And I say unto thee, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You notice what Jesus is saying here? He said, He is like the rock. That's why we're saying, Rock of ages. Cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. He is the rock immovable. He is the rock unchanging. He is the rock. All the blows and all the adversity and all the adversary, all the enmity of the people of the world cannot move that rock. And he says, I build my church on that rock. And that same church will prevail. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Jesus knew that the heathen will rage. And the people will imagine a vain thing. And that the kings of the earth will set themselves against him. And they will say, we're going to break their bands asunder. We're going to cast his authority, his power away from us. But Jesus said he knew the outcome even before the beginning of their rage. He said his church will be built upon the rock. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. In line with that, let us see the second point. That in the midst of the enmity, in the midst of all the opposition and the persecution, the kingdom of Christ will be established. Come back to Psalm 2, from verse 4. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. You know why? Because God knew that his plans and purposes have always been opposed by the devil, by the evil spirits, by unregenerate, unconverted men. This wasn't the first time he had a plan and a purpose for the life of Joseph. All the people that knew Joseph, they went against that plan and purpose, and eventually God achieved his purpose in the life of Joseph. Do you remember Israel? God brought up Israel in the land of Egypt. And yet Pharaoh said, let us deal wisely with them. They were in a conspiracy with all the people of Egypt to kill all the children, all the boys. And yet God was laughing at them. Because you see, Pharaoh's daughter went to the riverside and he saw a little baby called Moses, the one that will overcome and drown Egypt and their chariots in the Red Sea. And he picked up Moses and loved Moses. And took him right in the palace where they made a decree to stamp out and crush and destroy the children of Israel. And took Moses there to take care of Moses. And to educate Moses. And to give him boldness and strategy and wisdom. And eventually it was that same Moses that led Israel out of Egypt. And then David, God knew that at the time of David, Saul saw that he could destroy that young man. Even the children of Israel, they rejected him. Even the Philistines are after him. And yet, we find that David reigned for 40 years. Many troubles, many waves, many rage of the enemy, many rage, uh, many tumult and rage of the enemy. And yet, the Lord saw David through. And now he knew that Christ will come. The greater than Solomon, the greater than Jonah, the greater than David, the greater than all the people of the Old Testament. If he fulfilled this plan on Joseph, on Moses, on Israel, on David, and the rest of the people, high about his only begotten son. That's why he seated in the heavens laughing at the unbelievers. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. 
what will he tell them? He will tell them, yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. And then he says, I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Can you see that authority and boldness? Can you see that dignity in the life of Jesus Christ? As he walked on the water, and the disciples were afraid, thinking, Will you not drown? He said, The Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. He was on his way to Jerusalem and he set his face as a fiend, as a fiend. And he said, the Jews are looking for you. Are you going there? Oh, he said, I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Go and tell the folks, I walk today and tomorrow. And the third day I shall be perfected. And as he faced Jerusalem and all the women were weeping. Oh, he said, weep not for me. When I die, I will rise again. He looked at his own disciples and he said, We go to Jerusalem. And all the Gentiles and all the Jews, they are going to take the Son of Man. And they are going to scorch him. And they are going to kill him. Then he didn't finish in the sad note. He finished in the note of triumph. He said, And on the third day, I will rise again. You see, that's the authority that he had. And every time they were saying that, Well, they, they may push you down in the cliff and they may destroy you, he will say, my time is not yet. And when he came to Pilate and they were questioning him and uh, he didn't answer at a particular time, this man said, don't you answer me? Don't you know that I have the authority to kill you and to set you free? He looked at him and said, you couldn't have any authority except what is given from above. He said, are you a king? He said, thou sayest, for this purpose was I born that they may declare the truth unto the world. And Pilate said, what is truth? And Jesus looked at him, and he kept quiet. He said, you want to understand? And Pilate rose up, and he said, what can I do with this man, the king of the Jews? I find no fault in him. And while he was about to try him, the wife had received a dream, and said, my husband, that person you are dealing with, have nothing to do with the blood of that innocent one. Jesus knew that he had been born a king. Jesus knew that he will reign. And thank God, Jesus will reign. I said, Jesus will reign. You see, the people of the world, they do not know that all this has been written in the Bible. And some of them are saying, we're not going to have Christ to reign over us. We're not going to have Jesus Christ to establish his religion. But God in heaven, he said, yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son. Thou art my son. You know, some people who don't understand, they say, How is God? How is Jesus the son of God? They say it's only the Christians that are saying so. They say in the Old Testament, there is nothing about the son of God. But you see here it says, The Lord said unto me, Thou art my son. Capital S. This day have I begotten thee. And then to show that the scope or the extent of the rulership of Jesus Christ will be all over the world. Look at verse 8. Ask of me. And I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance. And the uttermost part of the earth for thy possession. Ask of me. And I will give thee the heathen for thine inheritance. And the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Brothers and sisters, this was written about 1,000 years before Jesus came. And yet, since Jesus came, do you, now, do you know now that all nations of the world, the name of Jesus is known. In many nations of the world, Jesus Christ is accepted as Lord by individuals. In many families, look at it in Nigeria here. Look at it in West African countries. Look at it in East African countries. Look at it in Central Africa. Look at it in Southern part of Africa. Look at it all over the world. That's why Jesus said, Ye shall receive power when the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and then unto the uttermost part of the earth. And then it says, Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's 
vessel. Which means that Jesus Christ definitely will reign as king. He is king of kings and is the Lord of lords. Matthew chapter 26, establishment of Christ's kingdom. Matthew 26, from verse 63. But Jesus held his peace. And the chief priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God, that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus says unto him, Thou hast said. Nevertheless, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the, on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. That's majesty talking. That's the dignity of the great king. He said, you will see it. The days will come. When the king, when he will come, as the king. And he will see it on the throne of power. In John chapter 18. From verse 33. Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again. And called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Thou sayest this. Says thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell thee of me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered unto the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king to this end, for this purpose, for this reason was I born. And for this cause I came into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. And everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. He was telling Pilate that he is the king. He is the one into whose hand the Lord has committed all authority and power. In John chapter 5 verse 20. John 5 20. For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth. And he will show him greater works than this that he may marvel. For as the Father raiseth up the dead, and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. For the Father judges no man, but has committed all judgment. He has committed all judgment unto the Son. There you can see that Jesus Christ has all authority and power. John chapter 3 verse 35. The Father loveth the Son and has given him all things, has given all things into his hand. First Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 23. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruit. Afterward, they that are Christ's at his coming. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father. When he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign. He must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. Jesus will reign. To him every knee shall bow. In Revelation chapter 11 verse 15. And the seventh angel sounded. And there were great voices in heaven saying. The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. He shall reign forever and ever. You see, sometimes you meet somebody and he said, I am the child of a governor. You meet somebody and he says, I'm a friend to the president. Well, you say, I have somebody more than president and governor. Jesus Christ, my savior, my friend, the lover of my soul. He is the one that will reign, not, not only over Nigeria, not only over Africa, and not only all over the world. For just a short period of time, he will reign forever and ever. Aren't you glad your Lord is the King? Your Lord is the one that will reign forever and ever. For the people that do not know the Lord, what will you do when the Lord is reigning? 
If you're an enemy of Christ, what will you do when Jesus comes to reign? That's why you are told in the exhortation to the people, the princes and the king. In Psalm 2, verse 10. Be wise now therefore, O ye kings, be instructed ye judges of the earth. Kings are always instructing other people. And sometimes they themselves are not well instructed in matters that are spiritual. In matters of eternal value. In matters relating to, their, to the salvation of their souls. And it says, be wise. Be wise. We need to be wise. Kings, judges, princes, and all the people of the earth. Be wise now. Tomorrow may be too late. Today is the time to be wise. And the reason to be wise is that the Lord will come. Jesus Christ will come. And he will dash all the vessels like the potter's clay. And this is the time you ought to give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because whether you like it or not, whether you join the enemy camp or not, the Lord Jesus Christ will reign all over the world. And then it says in your wisdom, verse 11, Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son. Kiss the son. This is not a kiss of betrayal. This is a believing kiss. A kiss of affection. A kiss of love. A kiss of worship. A kiss of adoration. A kiss of submission. A kiss of surrender. You see the people of olden days, whenever they submitted to a lord, they submitted to an emperor, they submitted to a benefactor, or they submitted to an idol, they will fall down and kiss the feet of the emperor, or kiss the feet of the idol. And here the Lord is saying that before the day of judgment will come, kiss the son. Give him a kiss of faith. Bow down before him and worship him. And give your life to him with a kiss of submission and surrender, worship and adoration. If you don't, it says, he will be angry and you will perish from the way. When a wrath is kindled but a little, it means that those who do not have Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, those who do not believe on the Lord, those who do not give him a believing kiss, a kiss of surrender, a kiss of adoration, a kiss of worship, that they will be judged on the last day. In John chapter 3, verse 36, He that believeth on the Son has everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way, when his wrath is kindled but for a little while. It says, He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6, from verse 12. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of air, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken with of a mighty wind, and the heaven departed as a scroll. When it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places, and the kings of the earth, great men, and rich men, and chief captains, and mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. And they said unto the mountains and rocks, fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that seated on the throne, and from the wrath and from the wrath of the Lamb, kiss the Son, lest he be angry. And ye perish from the way, when his wrath is kindled but a little. These kings and princes, because they did not kiss the Son. They did not believe on the Lamb of God. They did not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. They now were afraid, and they tell, told the mountains, fall on us. Hide us from the face of him that seated on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come. And who shall be able to stand? Who shall be able to stand? The Lord is calling you today. Be wise now therefore. O ye kings of the earth. 
and be instructed, O ye judges of the earth. Kiss the Son. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. In Revelation chapter 22, verse 17. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, whosoever wants to, to avoid and escape the judgment of God, whosoever will, whosoever wants to believe today, whosoever wants to be wise today and be instructed today, let him take the water of life freely. Let him take the water of life freely. Today, the love of God is waiting for you. Jesus Christ died for you. And is inviting everyone. It says, All that labor and are heavy laden come unto me. And I will give you rest. This is the day of salvation. This is the day of mercy. This is the day when you can call upon the Lord and believe on the Lord. And you will escape the judgment of God. If you do not believe today, at this day of opportunity, the day of judgment is coming. That all who have rejected Christ will have the wrath of God fall upon them. Let's rise up. Kiss the sun. Rise up, fear the Lord. Rise up, rejoice with trembling. Rise up and give him a kiss of adoration. A kiss of worship. A kiss of surrender. A kiss of submission. A kiss of total yieldedness to the Lord. He is Lord. He is King. He will reign forever and ever. Open up your heart today. Let him reign over you. Open up your heart today. Let him reign over you. Surrender your heart to Jesus. Surrender your life to Jesus. He is Lord. He is Lord. He is Lord. He will reign wherever there is sun. The time is coming when he will smash and destroy all enmity. Do not be found among the enemies of Christ. Do not be found among the rejecters of Christ. Do not be found among the persecutors of Christ. Do not be found among the enemies of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Do not be found among the people that are raging. Among the people that are rejecting Christ. Kiss the Son. Love the Son. Worship the Son. Surrender to the Son. Give yourself completely to the Lord. Let Him be your Lord. Let Him be your Lord. Let Him be your King. Let Him be your Redeemer. Let him be your savior. Let him rule over your life today. And say, he is my Lord. He is my king. He is my redeemer. Jesus is king. Jesus is Lord. Let him reign over your heart. Let him reign over your life. Jesus, king of kings. Lord of lords. Let him reign. Reign, Master Jesus, in my life, in my heart, in my home, in my plans. Let Jesus reign. Have you surrendered your life to Jesus? All the kingdoms of the world will belong to Christ eventually. Let Jesus be Lord and King and Master of your very life. Be wise. Make him your Savior. Make him your Lord. Kiss the Son. 